this is Kip coming and joining you for this next section. Um, uh, it's our pleasure to provide an overview at this point of state and federal responses. Oh, I probably should share the screen now, shouldn't I? Let's see now. Oh, there we go. And back in. And oh, come on. What is happening? There we go. Oh, God, why is every time I touch it, it's doing that? Sorry, folks. Technical difficulties, as always. Every time I touch this, it's going glitchy. So I go into this. Okay, good. So right? And then now when I touch this, it goes out. I don't know what people are seeing. They're not seeing anything, actually. Oh, maybe that's why. Let's see. There we go. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to listen to that whole dialogue there, but we're back and uh, uh, on the air. We feel like a DJ in here. I wait, I'll send you all a picture after this because it's ridiculous. We got like five screens going and cell phones, and uh, I hope you can enjoy it as much as we can. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce the next section. It's an overview of state and federal responses to climate change. We talked about climate change and kind of what it is. We've introduced you to what local government is. And we want to give you now a picture of what's going on at the state and the federal uh, side of things. And we have a great roster lined up. And so I'm going to start in uh, right away with our first speaker, Michael McCormick. Um, and uh, he is, come on. The Deputy Associate Director of Climate Preparedness at the Council on Environmental Quality uh, in Washington. Um, Michael is, uh, prior to this position, Michael worked at the Governor's Office of Planning and Research from July 2011 through August of 2014. Michael has worked between organizations internal and external to the state and federal government to develop tools that local governments can use to develop more effective plans and policies to address climate change. Michael has experience working in academic, local government, and consulting capacities, and has been on the boards of several nonprofits, including the American Planning Association, the Sustainability Academy, and the Association of Environmental Professionals. Uh, Michael's been a, a great contact, and as a number of people have referenced uh, in the last couple of days, he was instrumental in uh, bringing together the uh, focus and attention on this program and helping bring this up to a governor's initiative. And so we're really glad to have Michael back. Uh, to join us, and I'm going to now uh, bring him on the line, and let's see. Why is there Michael? Michael, can you hear us? Can or Thank you, can Kip. You? Yeah, I'm on, the, I'm on the phone. Can you hear me? Excellent. I can hear you just clearly, and I assume all else can. Thank you. Welcome, Michael. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Kip, and to LGC for inviting me to participate in today's discussion. Um, today I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about what the federal government is doing on climate with a focus on some of the resources you'll be able to access now and in the near future. There's a number of things that are going to be going live in the next month or two, which hopefully we think you'll, uh, you'll find very valuable on the ground in your work. Um, so much of the federal government's work on climate is organized around the themes that are laid out in the President's Climate Action Plan. Uh, one is cutting carbon pollution, also known as greenhouse gas emissions. Two, preparing the U.S. for the impacts of climate change, um, you know, through vulnerability and resiliency. Uh, leading international efforts to address climate change as well uh, is one of our other priorities. I won't be going into too much detail there, um, but there are a number of international initiatives in process to help support actions on climate change around the world. There's a number of actions that came from the Climate Action Plan uh, specifically regarding technical data and tools, outreach and coordination, catalyzation of locally grown initiatives, uh, which California is very good at, um, public-private partnerships, and technical assistance and capacity building. And of course, interest of interest to all of you, uh, President Obama has asked the federal government to look at how we can incorporate national service into federal programs across the board including those designed to address climate change, renewable energy, and community resilience. So <clears throat> I'm going to walk through a couple of programs that you'll receive links for 
I believe after this webinar, unless you've already received the links, um, it, it'll provide some good context to some of the work the federal government is doing and hopefully provide linkages back to uh, some of the local resources that you're going to hear about. You know, I'm going to talk a little bit about the connection back to some of these California resources as well. I think we found in, in D.C. that California has, has been a leader, um, particularly from locally generated content and materials to regional collaboratives. And, of course, the state of California has been a leader for many years in dealing with climate change. Uh, so much of the work that we're doing in D.C. is responding directly to uh, a number of the initiatives that California and, and uh, other local governments within the state have moved forward. So one, which uh, Governor Brown is a member of, uh, is the State, Local, and Tribal Leaders Task Force on Climate Preparedness and Resilience. So as a part of the President's Climate Action Plan, he signed an executive order establishing the task force and um, basically helping to advise the administration on how the federal government can respond to the needs of communities nationwide that are dealing with the impacts of climate change. The task force members included state, local, tribal leaders from across the country who used their firsthand experiences in building climate preparedness and resilience in their communities to inform their recommendations to the administration. We're currently um, going through the final uh, details of the report, and the task force will provide these recommendations to the president. Um, we're uh, aiming for mid-November. Um, we intend, uh, we expect that those recommendations will include removing barriers to resilient investments, modernizing federal grant and loan programs to better support local efforts, and developing the information and tools needed to prepare uh, for climate impacts. Uh, among a number of other measures as well. So another um, initiative that, that you'll find helpful is the National Climate Assessment. Um, it's the federal government's analysis of the impacts of climate change on the United States. It splits the U.S. into different regions. Uh, California is located in the southwest region. It has a, a wealth of valuable information and case studies you can use to inform your discussions at the local level. But knowing you're in California, you also have a couple of fantastic resources that um, cross-reference and expand and go into more detail than the National Climate Assessment does. And this includes CalADAPT, the Adaptation Planning Guide, the State Hazard Mitigation Plan, and a number of other resources that you'll either hear about in the next presentations or you'll learn about through um, other training opportunities that LGC is doing. And so all of these resources together will hopefully show you the way to plan for climate impacts and emissions reductions at the local level. Now, if you're more technically minded, um, the federal government does host an open climate data website, and uh, this is associated with the president's climate data initiative. Basically, we're trying to get uh, climate data available for third parties, business, um, and folks out there that, that need that data to develop tools and resources that benefit their own organizations and the public. The federal government spends about $2.5 billion a year on climate data, so really try and improve on how we release that information for user groups outside the federal government. We're also trying to capture that data and turn it into better information, um, really for the, the, the policy-driven user. So the climate data initiative and, and that piece is specifically for technical folks that that get the technical side of, of using climate data. But for the policy-driven folks, um, the Climate Resilience Toolkit is being developed as a means to present federal data, but also linked to local and regionally appropriate tools, resources, case studies, and funding opportunities. We're also planning on launching this um, in mid-November. And this was a part of the President's Climate Action Plan, but we've also had a number of the President's Task Force members recommend the development of this toolkit. It's, it's going to first be launched in, in a uh, phase one. It'll be somewhat of an iterative, iterative process as we build out capability, um, but uh, there is going to be some great usability in there as you do your work. Um, you'll also be able to cross-reference it with CalADAPT. CalADAPT will be a resource that's specifically called out in the Climate Resilience Toolkit, um, and some of the resources that CalADAPT references are also folded into the toolkit. on the Climate Resilience Toolkit uh, as part of the ongoing training regimen for CivicSpark uh, once it goes live. Uh, and I'll be looping back with LGC to see if that makes sense. Um, 
All this being said, in many cases, it's probably going to be better to use the CALADAP and the adaptation planning guide for many efforts in California because it's a California-specific resource that was designed for California's unique regulatory structure. Um, but at the same time, we do hope the Resilience Toolkit will be helpful. There will also be a website coming, a website link coming to you regarding the EPA state and local climate and energy program. Um, there's a number of valuable tools in there, and we hope that you'll be able to go through and find some value in those resources. So one important discussion that uh, every local decision maker is really uh, having right now, and, and it's really on their mind, is the cost of dealing with climate change and the programs that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So one of the things the federal government is trying to do is estimate these costs while at the same time estimating the costs of inaction. Recent reports from Ceres and the Risky Business Project do just this. Many of the discussions are backed up by FEMA estimates that every $1 spent on pre-disaster planning saves $4 in recovery costs. Specifically in the Risky Business Report and Economic Risks of Climate Change in the U.S., if we continue our current path by 2050, between $66 billion and $106 billion rise up to 1.2 feet by the mid-century mid and by 3.5 feet by the end of the century. And there's still one in 100 chance that sea level rise could uh, go more than 6.3 feet by 2100. Um, and for the federal government, we think about San Diego as a really strategic, uh, an important strategic component to the U.S. military. The city is home to three marine installations, three naval bases, and the Coast Guard station. Uh, fortunately, the military has been planning for um, for climate impacts, as well as many other uh, federal agencies. And you can read in the most uh, very current climate adaptation plan just released by the Department of Homeland Security uh, some of the plans for uh, the DOD dealing with uh, climate impacts. And when it comes to sustainability and resilience plans, uh, there will be uh, 36 agencies uh, will be releasing their resilience and sustainability plans toward later toward this month. Um, so I think when you're when you're thinking about federal facilities that are within the region that you're working, take a look at these plans and make sure you're linking into those federal efforts to reduce emissions and become more resilient. Most federal agencies, um, both the headquarters and regional offices, are on board with collaborating on local and regional initiatives on climate. They can help by offering technical assistance, doing convenings, providing meeting space, and sharing technical inf information to policy guidance. Um, keep an eye for the, for the Climate Resilience Toolkit and the President's Task Force recommendations to come out in November as well. I really want to thank you for your work, your service, and dedication uh, to making the communities uh, that you're, you're working in better places to live. And I want to thank LGC again and the state of California for doing the hard work to set up Civic Spark and to bring the right people together to create a successful program. You may notice that in CNCS is the Corporation for National and Community Services Sustainability Plan that comes out later this month, that there's a re reference to a Civic Spark type of program. Your work here in California is inspiring a national initiative around community resilience. Um, so take uh, pride in your work, and I, I wish you much luck and look forward to uh, hearing the value of your work on the ground in the future. Uh, that being said, I'll hand it back to Kiss. Um, thank you very much. Michael, thank you so much. And uh, don't know if you have a second for questions. If anybody wanted to type in a question, I'd be happy to pass it along to Michael. Uh, and uh, our regional supervisors around the state are sort of gathering in uh, questions, and, and sometimes uh, they'll come forward. So if you give us a second, Michael, if you have it, we'll uh, see if anybody has a particular question for you. Sure. And I think, you know, Michael, it, you know, I'll just comment while we're waiting. It's been great to see the uh, flow of ideas across uh, from what you said. We've touched on a number of these issues and will touch on more of them. And I hope that uh, 
the Civic Spark members are seeing how interconnected many of these issues are, uh, whether it's talking about uh, FEMA and the, the value of resilience or the tools that are being developed here, such as CalADAPT that are informing federal policy. Uh, we're really right in the mix of some really critical activities and issues. Um, and so, you know, I really thank you for highlighting some of those for us. Um, it looks like we don't have any questions at this point. So, um, Michael, again, I want to thank you for your time and, and as always, appreciate your comments. Thank you, Kip. So, uh, with this, I'm going to turn over to our next speaker, uh, Louise Bedsworth. Uh, she is the Deputy Director uh, at the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, also known as OPR. Prior to joining OPR, she was a research fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California, where she focused on climate action at the local level, adaptation to climate change, and transportation and air quality. She has also held positions at the Union of Concerned Scientists, Redefining Progress, and the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. She holds a BS in Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences from MIT, and an MS in Environmental Engineering, and a PhD in Energy and Resources from UC Berkeley. Uh, it's our pleasure to have uh, Louise with us. Um, she is, uh, does have a uh, PowerPoint, and so as I let her introduce herself, I will also be getting her slides up and ready. Louise, uh, are you with us? Hello, Louise. Can you hear us? Yeah, you can probably hear me better now. I took my phone off mute. Is that better? <laughs> <laughs> Always um, these fun things that we have to do. <laughs> I know. Yes, I'm sorry. I guess I was muted already. I, I was double muted. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm here. Yeah. Oh, good. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're just going to um, get your slides up here, uh, which I'm hoping are readily visible to me. Oops. Uh, okay, got it. Uh, you can go ahead if you have any opening comments, please. It'll take me a second. Great. Well, thank you um, for having me here today, and I think um, uh, thank you to all of the um, Civic Spark members. We're really excited about this program. I know you heard from Ken Alex, our director, yesterday, and um, we're all just uh, thrilled to have everyone on board and doing this. So thank you, and thank you to Michael, who, and Kiff, and others who really have gotten this um, program off the ground and. Um, we're very excited to get it started and happy to be here as a resource as it moves along. So hope that we can interact with you all moving forward. Um, so I was asked to give an overview of California's climate policy landscape, and I'll do this um, from just an We have a discussion draft of that document available. Change. Um, so I will give that a bit of a 30,000 foot level, and then I know um, Ashley Conrad Seda and J.R. De La Rosa will go into a bit more detail on some of the specific pieces. So if you want to move to the, I guess, to the next slide. Um, I imagine you all have seen this, but I think it's important to start with, which is the challenge of climate change that we're facing here in California and what we're doing about it. Um, the red line in this graph shows our, um, the solid red line is our historic emissions. The blue dotted line is our um, projected business as usual emissions absent any policy, um, not the path that we are on. Um, and what the red dotted line shows us going from 2010 down to our 2020 goal, which is to hit 1990 emissions by 2020, that's our AB 32, um, the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006 goal. And that is also accompanied by a longer term goal that is from an executive order that was passed under Governor Schwarzenegger but has been confirmed by Governor Brown to reduce emissions 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. 
Um, we are on track, and I think you'll probably hear more, um, but to hit this 2020 target, the most recent update to the state's um, scoping plan shows that the programs and policies were put in place, including the state's cap and trade program, our vehicle emissions regulations, our renewable portfolio standard, those are all helping us to reduce our emissions in California um, or putting us on that path. But that's really just a stopping point on this way to 2050. And so when we look out to 2050, what does that mean? Um, well, as you can see, just from looking at this um, picture, it's a, it's a steeper line from 2020 to 2050. And so when we look out, we're looking, if we want to do a constant rate of emission reduction, a constant um, tons per year, we're going to have to be reducing emissions at about um, two and a half times the rate that we have been to get to our 2020 target, to hit our 2050 target. And we're, if we want to do a constant percent reduction, we're going to have to be reducing emissions at about five and a half, or about five times as quickly as we have been. So it's a, it's a big challenge and one we're really looking um, for, looking to and trying to think how do we get us on that path and what do we need to do as a state to keep us on that steeper red line. Um, and I think, uh, again, I think you'll hear more, but we have our 2020 target. We have a 2050 um, goal that is in an executive order. There's conversations happening right now about what do we do between 2020 and 2050 to get us on that line and keep us on that line and to guide the, emission, or guide the investments that we're making to ensure that we're achieving those reductions. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, which will show the... Um, uh, projected increase in annual average temperature for California over this coming century. And what this shows is that in 2050, anywhere from a, just under a 2 to over a 5 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature is projected. And by 2100, um, around a 3.5 to 4 degree Fahrenheit increase up to 9 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, those are our projected increases in annual average temperature. And I think a few things I um, like to flag when I show this graph are um, first, none of these bars, neither of these bars go down to zero. So what that means is we are already committed to a certain amount of temperature increase in California. In fact, we are seeing it happening now. We're seeing the impacts of climate change now. Um, but the fact is we're going to see even more in the future. Um, the range in those bars, the fact that they're not a single dot, that they span a temperature range, is the uncertainty that we have, both in what's going to happen with global emission reductions, how successful we're going to be in reducing emissions, and how sensitive the atmosphere is going to be to the emissions that are up there already and have, are going to continue to be put up there. So we have uncertainty in that path of what's going to happen globally, um, and we have the fact that some amount of change is inevitable and we are already experiencing it. So on the next slide, I will start now moving more into what our policies are to deal with those two challenges. And this is just a schematic to show really we have a comprehensive approach to climate change in California. I mentioned this environmental goals and policy report, which I'm not going to go into uh, much detail on other than to say what it really provides is a vision for the state and some of our cross-cutting goals. And I will touch on those goals as I go through the pieces underneath. What that document, though, does is it really forms an umbrella that, that frames a lot of what we're doing to address climate change in California, which falls really into three groups. The first is to reduce emissions. The second is to prepare for the impacts of climate change. So that's first the graph that shows us with the trajectory. The second is to prepare for those impacts, the temperature increases and all the associated effects with that. And then the third really critical piece that I think you'll, um, I'll touch on and we'll hear more about is also the research that we're doing in California to inform our policy. Um, in the orange boxes I just listed. just this year is really our guiding document um, for reducing emissions. We have Safeguarding California, which is our guiding document for um, preparing for the impacts. And then we have a climate change research plan and scoping for our first, fourth climate assessment for research. So in this, we just talk about some of our key goals on our um, policies for reducing emissions. We have a 2020 target I mentioned thinking about a midterm emission reduction goal and the commitment to those long-term reductions. 
in terms of safeguarding California, what we're really looking at in terms of adaptation or safeguarding is integrating climate change into our planning and investment at the state level, thinking about as we're making decisions and looking to the future that we're considering what our future conditions are going to look like, and then providing data, tools, and guidance to plan for climate risks. And that's a lot of um, what Michael just touched on as well, the tools like CalAdapt, um, our geo portal, uh, we have a, that all of these tools that, that can help provide information about what the future is going to look like. Um, and so now I'll just touch on, I think, some of our, what I think are our key cross-cutting goals as we look towards the future. These are what we outline in more detail in the environmental goals and policy report that really shape a lot of this policy and a lot of the actions that we're taking. And I think you'll hear more specifics about from the other presenters as well. So on the next slide, um, the first um, cross-cutting goal is to decarbonize energy and transportation in California. This is really talking about continuing the transformation that we have seen over the last decade or so in California where we have been reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from our passenger vehicles. We've been promoting zero emission vehicles and clean transportation fuels. We've been promoting and achieving tremendous improvements in energy efficiency and where we're pushing for the development of clean and renewable energy systems, both at um, a large scale system that can replace a power plant, but also distributed um, generation and smaller systems, rooftop PV, um, photovoltaic systems, and, and the like. This also encompasses our goals around Senate Bill 375 and promoting smart land use and the reduction of vehicle miles traveled. So what we're really looking to do here is build a low carbon transportation, energy, and land use system in California that is connected by um, our investment in high-speed rail that is interconnected to robust um, local transit systems and smart land use powered by clean, uh, renewable sources of electricity uh, and, then use, and using energy and electricity in the most efficient way that we can. So on the next slide, uh, the other important um, cross-cutting goal is really to be looking at building sustainable and healthy communities. And so this is thinking from the ground up, how do we support the, the achievement of the state's long-term goals at a local and a regional scale? And I think this is a lot of what, um, at, through Civic Spark, you'll be able to be working on, which is thinking about opportunities to promote active transportation through complete streets, pedestrian, and bicycle infrastructure, uh, integrating sustainable communities planning uh, helping on the development at the regional level and thinking about how to link that to local action and local plans at the city and the county level. Um, promoting infill development. Uh, the state has a set of planning priorities. The first of those is to promote infill development. That is development in areas that are already developed, taking advantage of existing infrastructure. Um, and then really integrating public health, climate change, and economic development into local planning to ensure that we have vibrant communities that support uh, the populations that live there. On the next slide, uh, a critical piece to all that we're doing is not just to focus on these built systems, but also to preserve and steward our natural resources in California. So thinking about preserving natural and working landscapes, uh, reflecting and accounting for the ecosystem services that they provide. So by that meaning that what kind of a value we get from a pristine and protected watershed or from protected habitat, how do we start reflecting that and valuing it more in the decisions that we're making as a state, reflecting the long-term benefit that it is providing in terms of the, um, uh, for instance, clean water, but also in terms of um, protection from climate change or other impacts. Using a regional approach to think about the preservation and protection of natural resources. Thinking of the quality of the protections that we provide, not just the quantity. So rather than just identifying areas for mitigation or protection, um, that we're thinking about the quality of that. So that's really thinking about moving to, think, um, to active stewardship of our natural resources. Um, and so, the, again, promoting this active management and stewardship of our resources so that we're maximizing the benefits both to the natural system but also to the benefits that are provided by it. So next, um, 
can't talk about uh, our long our state's long term future right now without talking about our need to support and build a sustainable water system. Uh, there have been important steps taken here um, on comprehensive groundwater management, some of the most important legislation on water, new laws on water passed just this year, just getting us on the path to manage groundwater resources for the for first time in California. Um, thinking about the intersection of water and energy um, and how that relates to our climate change goals um, and the amount of energy that we use to move water around the state. Also delivering safe and clean drinking water to everyone in California thinking about how this then connects back to protecting habitat and species and building a water system that is resilient and robust in the face of a changing climate. So finally, the last one I'll touch on is incorporating <clears throat> excuse me, climate resilience into all of our policies investments in California. We have a climate uh, emission reduction goal. We have AB 32. We have our long-term goal for 2050. And what we're really thinking about now is how do we really institutionalize climate, safeguarding ourselves from climate impacts in a similar way? How do we move towards thinking about climate change in all of our policies and investments so that we're investing in a smart way that is going to be resilient in the face of future change? Um, some next steps on here, and I know JR will be talking about the safeguarding plan or some of the recommendations there are about developing guidelines for the infrastructure investments that we're making and prioritizing green and natural infrastructure solutions. A lot of these are solutions that can help us get multiple benefits, um, both in reducing emissions and providing protection. So in the last slide, I just want to touch also on, um, on the role that research plays in the entirety of California's climate policy. It really serves a foundational role. Um, when California adopted AB 32 in 2006, the available science on the impacts of climate change on California, which the state had invested in, were critical for building support for that legislation and getting that first ever um, economy-wide greenhouse gas standard in the United States passed. Um, California's uh, re climate change research is really motivated by our policy needs as well. So we are shaping policy with this research we're doing, and we're shaping the research we're doing by what our policy needs are. It's a very iterative and dynamic process. So right now we are in the process of scoping the state's fourth comprehensive uh, assessment of climate impacts. It's called the California um, Climate Change Assessment. And if you look um, on the state's climate portal, you will see that the uh, results of the first, second, and third assessments. In each case, we have built on the previous assessment to um, address gaps in information and to inform what our policy challenges are. Right now, with this assessment, we're really looking towards informing adaptation and safeguarding actions um, and building on policy needs that, or sorry, research needs that have been stated throughout our policy documents that we have in California. I touched on just three here, but there are many others as well, um, but so it's not to overwhelm. I didn't want to throw them all in here, but really looking at what do we need to protect public health, to protect agriculture, to support our water system, um, for our energy system, for our transportation system. So this fourth assessment, which is um, there's a draft scope of work out now and that is getting finalized over the next month or month and a half will go out um, for a request for proposals uh, early next year. And um, those will be a set of research projects that are going to help us advance and forward our um, adaptation needs in particular, and also help to provide additional information and information that is compatible with CalAdapt and other tools that we have available so that it can be easily utilized um, by local governments and local agencies, state agencies, regional partners to advance um, on the ground climate action. Um, and so with that, I think that is a, a snapshot overview of, of what we're doing uh, from a high level in California, and I know others will go into much more detail on specific pieces of that. So thank you. 
Thank you so much. And um, Kip just had to run out. So this is Kristen. Um, yeah. Small change <laughs> in no the announcer here. But um, thank you so much for, for that. I think that was a wonderful overview. We, If you have um, time, would you mind just staying on for just a little bit longer in case anyone has questions? Not um, at all. Not at all. Okay. Wonderful. Um, let's see. And we've got one already that you might be able to speak to, which is how will teams utilize CalAdapt? That's a great question. So CalAdapt is um, an online tool that you can look at a local level. about how you would use CalAdapt in that um, in that effort. I think CalAdapt could also be, um, you know, and so that really is a, a will help walk you through the process. There are certainly other applications where you could pull in information from CalAdapt uh, when working on a general plan. Let's say you were developing a safety element of a general plan and you want to think about climate resilience more um, effectively or more thoroughly in that effort. You could use CalAdapt to take a look at the projected risks of climate change in your area. So I think there are a number of applications. The one that would be, I think, a very um, well linked in terms of this bit of the how-to guide is thinking about the adaptation planning guide and the development of an adaptation strategy. Sorry about that. I was just talking to myself on mute. Um, okay. <laughs> on the question, and I had moved the slides back, and I was wondering why I wasn't hearing a response. No. On the first slide, there was a question from the San Diego team. Um, the steep slope for the trajectory versus the historic trend, if you could just explain the reasoning for that a little bit more. Sorry. So the, um, the difference between the solid red line and the dotted red line? Uh, yes, I believe yeah. so. So the solid line um, going up to 2010, and, and this actually could be updated with some slightly uh, going up with real data through 2012, the California Air Resources Board produces the state's greenhouse gas emission inventory. Um, what, so what, these are actual calculated slash measured numbers on the solid part to the left of 2010. The red dotted line is a line that just, that shows the path that we need to be on you know, a straight line path to get to 2020 and to get to 2050. So those two dots, the one at 2020, the red one at 2020, and the red one at 2050, are our emission reduction targets. So in 2020, it's about 430 roughly um, million megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent a year, and um, it's just under 100 in 2050. Uh, the blue dotted line is is a, is a tough one to um, actually know for sure what it would have looked like had we not, um, if we weren't taking action. But let's just, the, the, what the blue line is meant to show is if we didn't do our renewable portfolio standard, if we didn't have standards for cars, um, you know, what would it, what, what our emissions looked like? Really with just in that case accounting for a growth in population, um, growth in vehicle miles traveled, and those things. That blue line, honestly, is, I think, a little bit steep. This, as the data are, are a bit old, um, it doesn't really account for the recession. <laughs> so you would probably not, in reality, it, the business as usual probably wouldn't be quite that extreme. Uh, <clears throat> and when you look, at, this graph doesn't show it, but with the emission inventory, you can actually see, so these are the data from, they're too scrunched up here, but. Um, from the Air Resources Board, you can see the decline in emissions that we have achieved in California. Um, and it's been a combination of, to, you know, on, honestly, of, of our policies. We also did see a decline in emissions because of the recession. 
um, you know, a, a few years back, uh, which we saw at a national level as well. Excellent. Thank you again. And it looks like um, as of now, those were all of the questions that we had. So I appreciate your time um, today and, and definitely thank you for, for coming and speaking. Sure, anytime. And please uh, just know OPR is here as a resource. We really look, look forward to working with everyone. So um, just be in touch. Hopefully we will have um, some guidance out on general plans soon. So we might have more to report. <laughs> Excellent. We will look forward to that. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Louise. So our next speaker, who I just unmuted, so actually let me know if you can um, hear us and uh, if we can hear you as well. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Wonderful. So Ashley Conrad today serves as the Deputy Secretary for Climate Policy at the California Environmental Protection Agency. Prior to joining Cal EPA, Ashley managed the Bureau of Land Management's Renewable Energy Program in California and was a Presidential Management Fellow with, most, with both the BLM and the Department of Energy. Ashley received her Bachelor's Degree in Ecology from Princeton and her Master's Degree in Environmental Science and Management from the Donald Bryn School at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And Ashley, I'm going to um, change the screen to include your uh, slides in just one moment. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll just get started by saying um, thanks for inviting me to do this, and especially it's, it's great to hear Louise's uh, presentation too because we work together all the time but we never get to hear how the other sort of summarizes what we're doing so that was very helpful and I'll actually have a slide that shows some of what she was talking about with the um, the downturn in the economy and how that affected uh, real-time emissions so there'll be some clarity there from that, that question that was just asked um, and yeah and seeing her presentation I feel like we, there's a few graphics we could share so that's good so thanks so much for having me here. Um, I was asked to speak about mostly our mitigation actions in the state, and so I'll cover um, a, a bunch of those. But I just just a note on the bottom of the slide, I did steal some text and language directly from Dave Mallory at the Air Resources Board. Um, so I can provide you more, more details from his very detailed presentation if there are questions at the end or, or on my own as well. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So, um, yeah, so just a summary in terms of a climate change shorthand on the mitigation side of things. Um, you'll hear many of us refer to AB 32, the, Cal the California's Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, um, cap and trade, which is one of the complementary policies employed by California to meet our climate goals. So cap and trade is sort of nested under AB 32, even though sometimes people think of cap and trade as its own entity. Um, the Renewable Portfolio Standard, or the RPS, is another complementary policy employed, but it was employed before AB 32 was enacted and then kind of seconded by AB 32. Um, the GGRF, or the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, it's our fund, that, the home for all the auction proceeds and a funding source for existing and innovative climate change mitigation programs, and, and I will talk about that um, also. Um, and then the final piece is co-benefits. And so with our, again, when we talk about expenditures, I'll explain that, but it's a target goal for greenhouse gas reduction fund expenditures. But just to help you um, with a shorthand, if you hear these things as you're talking to state officials, that's kind of how they work. So next slide. Um, so I'm sure many of you know this, but there, these are the sources of greenhouse gases in, in California and, and throughout the world, but in California these are our major ones. So obviously we produce a lot of food here, so agriculture is a big source, and um, in grad school we used to get our professors to try to say cow poops and farts because um, that was a big source, that's a big source, the methane coming from enteric fermentation, which is the uh, euphemism for that first piece that I said. Um, we also have a big portion coming from refrigerants. Um, it looks like the transportation label fell off on the PDF, but transportation is 39% of the emissions in the state. Um, electricity, that's 19% of our emissions in the state. And then water and waste. So, um, so you know, the bulk of the emissions, about just under 60%, come from transportation and electricity, but the remaining 4% comes from industry, waste, water, refrigerants, and agriculture. So once we knew that these were the sources in state, we had to come up with programs that would capture those emissions as best as possible um, under a series of policies that were command and control or market-based. Next slide, please. Mm 
Next slide, if possible. Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, AB 32 was that big policy that in incorporated all of the different sources of emissions through these complementary policies. And the goal of AB 32 was to achieve, and it still remains, to achieve 1990 emissions levels by 2020. Um, and the way the statute is written, it, it actually uses the term to continue emissions reductions after 2020, or it was the stated intent to continue those emissions reductions. Right now, it's a question of, does that mean we continue emissions at the 1990 level, or we in it continue to um, decrease the amount of emissions the state uh, emits every year? And so I think we all choose to, um, to assume that we, we drop those emissions over time, but uh, we'll see how that works out over the next couple of years. So <clears throat> we wanted to, under AB 32, adopt some sort of emission reporting regulation for greenhouse gases. Um, and then these early action measures that are things that you could do before all the policies came into play and before the cap was actually enacted through cap and trade. Uh, and then uh, Louise referred to this scoping plan, but it was a, the idea is you have a scoping plan that, quote, scopes out all the different actions you can take to achieve these emissions reductions. But you'd need to update that every five years because the, the system is not static and people's behavior is not static. And as we saw with the recession, obviously, the impact of the recession uh, really changed our emissions profile around the state. So we saw a drop in emissions from the transportation and electricity sector, and we saw people kind of tightening their belts, and, um, and that really did change our emissions over those few years. Um, we, we haven't bounced back fully, but uh, you know we're, we're coming back up the trend now. Um, AB 32 also gave the Air Resources Board the authority to adopt a schedule of fees, and um, that's, that's what gets us into the cap-and-trade program. So next slide. So this is um, under, you know, under AB 32, these are, um, at, with that slide that Louise showed you where emissions were going up, what we've got here on the left is business as usual. metric tons. And because the sources of greenhouse gas reductions are so diverse, we needed a diversity of programs to address them. So there was no one size fits all to get us those 80 million metric tons. And that's why we came up with a, this range of complementary policies. Again, some of them command and control, some of them market-based, some of them incentive programs, um, some of them offsets, just different ways of addressing these. So for in this slide, for each of the program names, you can see the relative contribution towards the million metric ton reduction on the right. The cap and trade program is the bulk of those reductions, but it's not, you know, it's not the majority. It's just the, the I sorry, not the bulk. It is the greatest amount of the reductions, but still not the majority. Um, and that all other measures at the bottom, that's, those are some of those advanced measures that we put in place or some existing programs that were around before AB 32 was passed. Next slide, please. So um, just to dial in more on cap and trade, because that's the program that you'll hear the most about, um, the goals were to cover 85% of California's economy. So to cover it, basically industrial and energy emissions and transportation emissions in the state. Um, and it was to be phased in over time. So not everyone would be essentially hit with a cap from the day the program started. Um, but it, the goal was also to show that you could actually sustain the economy in California and support the environment. So the, the way we would do this by, was by um, putting, basically in, uh, influencing technology forcing. So by setting different standards in all these different areas where there's an impact, um, you know, in industry and energy and transportation, you could encourage people to be innovative, to change their behavior, and ultimately meet our reductions without necessarily having to pay a high price. So we wanted to give some flexibility to industry, to fuels producers to say, how am I going to meet this cap? Am I going to change my behavior and, and use less energy? Or am I going to pay the cost of carbon emissions um, through the cap and trade program? 
and ultimately end up coming to the same price, same, same spot. So we, we kind of gave options with the cap and trade program and we wanted to also be complementary to existing air quality and GHG programs that were within uh, AB 32. And this whole idea of a flexible mechanism with a strict cap, it would allow for market behavior to actually make up the difference in the cap rather than the government enforcing either a tax or some specific technology. Um, I think government understands that you know, we don't know the answers when it comes to technology, and so allowing the market and the people who, knows the, who know those answers to get engaged and to uh, participate in cap and trade would allow for some crazy and, and amazing innovation here in California. Um, and finally, you know, with cap and trade, there was never any goal that California would just go it alone. Um, there's an understanding, of course, that the emissions reductions that California can achieve are essentially a drop in the bucket for what we need worldwide in order to avoid the big climate catastrophes that we're already seeing underway and the even bigger ones we can assume if we don't actually change our behavior. So. Um, we can work with other jurisdictions either through some formalized information sharing, for example, through memoranda of understanding like what we have with both China and Mexico, um, or we could do this through formal linkage like the full linkage we have with Quebec um, and our first joint auction is set to go in place on, on November 19th, so just about a month from now. Uh, next slide, please. So the next several slides, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on, but I put them up here for you to use them. And they describe in a little bit more detail all of the different complementary uh, programs under AB 32. So um, we have the low carbon fuel standard, uh, and that's an effort to basically decrease carbon intensity in all of our fuels. Um, and right now, there's, it's, it's somewhat like the cap and trade program, where there are credits being exchanged by entities that need to lower their carbon intensity, but it's different from the program too, and both of these are being amended over time. Next slide. The Renewable Portfolio Standard, as I mentioned before, the RPS, we have a 33% RPS target in the state, which means that utilities need to procure 33% of their energy from renewable sources, and um, it's managed by both the Energy Commission and the Public Utilities Commission on different pieces. So the you know, procurement pieces and then eligibility are, are split between the PUC and the CEC, and it's a careful dance. There are a lot of federal agencies involved as well because the land mass where we have a lot of solar potential is actually managed by our federal partners. Next slide. So advanced clean cars, again, this is another, uh, another one of the complementary programs. We're really pushing a lot of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, you know, um, lower net energy vehicles, and, and to set stringent vehicle emission, emission standards that can actually be exported to other jurisdictions as well. Next. Um, SB 375, Louise also mentioned this, and this is essentially a planning approach or a change in the way we envision cities and urban areas in the state. So if you can integrate transportation, land use, housing, um, you can actually provide people uh, a way to reduce their vehicle miles traveled. And so VMTs or vehicle miles traveled are the metric we use. And I'm sure many of you know this, but the, that's the metric we use to figure out if um, we have achieved more sustainable cities over time. Next slide. So then there are these other AB32 measures um, that you can see listed here. Uh, again, I can provide more details on these, but these are other ways to achieve emissions reduction goals, both in the near term and the long term. Next slide. So this is where we see broken out a little bit uh, more about our emissions over time. And this may be a somewhat difficult uh, slide to get. But so on the, on, on the left-hand side, we've got um, our emissions over time. And then on the right-hand side, we have how our G GDP is doing. And so that's the, that's the red line. And then the bars are our emissions. So if you see from 2008 to 2011, our emissions decreased. And that was, you know, in part due to what was going on in the financial sectors and the financial markets. So that was in part our recession. But then you see in 2012, you know, we started to recover in 2010, 2011. So in 2012, you can see with that red line, the GDP recovers. So our GDP comes back to where it was in 2008. Yet our, our, our emissions have a delta of about 12 million metric tons between 2008 and 2012. And we think that that is um, in, in part due to these advanced measures that we put in place, and also in part due to people understanding the impact of their behavior on their spending. 
so this is 2012 is before the cap, uh, before we have data from when the cap was in place. So we're expecting to see those 2013, 2014 numbers have, you know, a decrease in emissions but a, an increase in GDP. So this gives us a good idea that what we're doing here in California is actually working. Next slide. Um, so uh, again, with with this. Sorry, I'm jumping a little bit now to auction proceeds. I mentioned the GDRF in the beginning. Um, with the cap and trade program, I, I didn't go into a lot of details, but it's an auction process where we um, auction off allowances, where each allowance represents one million metric ton uh, of, or sorry, one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. And so for each metric ton, there's a cost associated with it, and it can be traded, and that cost can go up depending on how scarce that resource is and how much demand there is in the market. And so because there's this market, there's actually proceeds that come to the state. So a portion of the proceeds actually go to um, go through a utility process. So the, the electricity pieces actually um, get returned to all of us through a climate credit on our utility bills, and hopefully many of you saw that credit uh, this month. And you should have received emails from your public utilities, or sorry, investor-owned utilities telling you um, to look for that climate credit. And then the other portion from fuels under the cap and other sectors industry, that comes back to the state coffers for use in continuing to decrease these greenhouse gas emissions. So with those proceeds, what we're doing as a state is investing them in the sectors with the greatest, green, greatest greenhouse gas emissions contributions. So um, that slide I showed you in the beginning where we see all of these different sectors where emissions are coming from, as a state, we looked around and said, well, how could we continue these reductions? You know, what could we do to actually improve emissions from the transportation sector, from ag? And so we came up with an investment plan that's, uh, that's by a legislative mandate. We have to come up with an investment plan every three years. And with that investment plan, we said, let's, let's be innovative. Um, so let's first invest in existing programs where we think that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that can still be realized. And so some of those were weatherizing homes, um, especially in low-income communities. So if you weatherize homes, you can save a lot of energy. Um, we also talked about, we also funded uh, dairy digesters in Central Valley to try to get more local community scale energy from ag waste. And especially in a drought year, we're seeing a lot of ag splash that needs to go somewhere rather than being burned. Um, we, we focused heavily on transportation, specifically on high-speed rail, on integrated hubs of transit, and on other kinds of clean transportation. And under that, uh, we also have this Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Grants Program that I'm sure many of you know about, and uh, hopefully you will attend public meetings or you have already on that portion. Um, and then we invested also in natural resources and waste, so in composting facilities around the state and in uh, helping wetlands actually be more resilient and sequester more carbon. Um, and the interesting piece about the natural resources and waste part, and this is kind of a hat tip to what JR will talk about next, is that in the natural resources and waste sector, you have an opportunity to spend this money in a way that sequesters carbon, but also provides the co-benefit of provide, providing resilience in the future. So that's where this co-benefit piece comes in, where when we had all this money to spend, we said, okay, let's reduce greenhouse gas emissions as our primary goal. But let's also think about what else we could do in terms of providing jobs for the state, uh, leading towards more resilience and sort of adaptation readiness in the state and um, and basically do more for our dollars than simply reducing greenhouse gas emissions, even though that's our threshold requirement for these dollars as a fee-based program. So in 2014-15, we're investing $832 million. And um, over the next several years, we'll have some money to invest, but we never forecast those funds. Because cap-and-trade is a market-based system, we don't want to influence the market by saying, you know, we know that we will bring in X number of dollars. We let the market do that work, and, um, and we see what we have each auction to have a better understanding of how our coffers are doing. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as, as uh, both Louise and I mentioned, so we, we did this AB32 scoping plan update this year, and um, this is just one slide on it. It's, it's pr very brief. I can, again, provide very specific details on each of these sections. You can also pull it up online. It's actually a pretty discreet document. Um, it's not too bad to sift through. But um, we said that we would continue greenhouse gas reductions in nine key topic areas. And some of those are new. In particular, short-lived climate pollutants is a new area for the scoping plan. And the reason we're bringing in short-lived climate pollutants is because short-lived climate pollutants have a very high potential for greenhouse gas 
emissions and for climate forcing. And so if you can reduce methane and reduce some of these other shorthanded SLCPs, you could actually make a near-term difference in our emissions. So we're coming up with a short-lived climate pollutant plan in the next year and reducing that, uh, um, putting that out by the end of 2015. But for the rest of these, a lot of them were already in the scoping plan and we were updating them based on what we've learned over the last several years. Um, in the natural and working land section, we committed to doing a lot of work, including developing a forest carbon plan to ensure that our forests sequester carbon and, and act as a sink for carbon over the next many years, decades to millennia, <laughs> to, um, to make sure that they, they do their job well and that we don't lose as many of them to wildfires. Um, so we, we received a lot of recommendations from other state agencies. This was a huge effort. It was not just ARB who put this out, but all the state agencies working together on recommendations and on how we would realize those goals. And hopefully some of you went to those public meetings as well. Uh, next slide, please. So just a final thought on moving forward. Um, in, you know, we, we're working right now on 2030 and 2050 goals, and Louise talked about this as well. Um, we have to be very aggressive if we are going to make our 2050 goal of 80% below 1990 levels. Again, that's not statutorily mandated, but it, there's an order on that, and if we can meet that goal, that would just be fantastic. But it really means transforming our economy and taking some bold steps here in California, changing our reliance on vehicles and things like that, um, or at least dirty vehicles. Um, we do need a coordinated state, regional, and local approach, so all of you will, will be very important in that piece and making sure that we coordinate and communicate with everyone. Um, we recognize that there's, as much as I've talked about all these programs, people are affected by the programs. People's health are affected by climate change. And so actually out doing outreach to people is really important, and I think all of you will be very helpful in that. Um, we need to make progress at the subnational and national level, and so you know we need to help the U.S. set its national target for emissions reductions. And right now we're working on that. So that there's federal action on existing and new power plants, and I'm not sure if Michael talked about that because I I missed his presentation. But we do need to work on setting these national targets and encouraging the State Department to, in part, take, take credit for what California is doing, but also encourage other states to take some bold actions to make sure that we have this national target. And then finally, also, maybe enhance some of these subnational agreements, so actively work with other jurisdictions where there are already emissions trading schemes, like in Europe and in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative on the East Coast, and in other countries, and like South Korea is thinking about these as well. Um, there are carbon taxes in Mexico and Chile, so how can we we work with these other subnational jurisdictions so that in aggregate there are these iterative reductions that result in these big worldwide benefits. And you know, sometimes it's usually easy to get um, dismayed or disheartened by the fact that not everyone has jumped on the bandwagon with California. But at the same time, if you look around the world and you start seeing you know, 30 to 50 of these jurisdictions starting to take real meaningful climate action, you realize that this is starting a big sea change. And, um, it feels, I feel optimistic and um, it feels encouraging to see other people taking action and, and reaching around, out around the world to learn more about what we're doing. So um, that's it for me. There's one last slide just with my contact information. I'm happy to be in touch further and to provide more details on all those slides, but I just ran through things very quickly and, uh, and let you recognize that I'm originally from New York and I'm a too fast speaker. So thank you so much and thanks for being part of the Civic Spark program and I look forward to working with you more. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, we do already have one question up and I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly which um, slide they might be referencing, but this is from the Central Coast team and they asked if you could address wave energy. And if you need a little bit more clarification about that, I can always try to unmute them or you might know exactly what they're talking about. Did you say wave energy or waste energy? Wave. Yes. Wave. Okay. Um, you know, I don't work explicitly on wave energy. I did when I was at the Department of Energy. Um, so for you Central Coast folks, this is not from my Cal EPA hat, um, but under, you know, under the renewable, well, I should say under the renewable portfolio standard, um, 
I do believe that ocean energy is still considered RPS eligible, but I don't know that officially. So I can look into that and get you an answer. Um, I have to look at, at where it falls under RPS eligibility, and maybe if Louise is still on, she knows the answer to that. But, um, but wave energy, the one challenge is the technology right now involves tethering to the ocean floor. And because California, and again, this is not my Cal EPA hat, this is my former DOE hat, because the ocean floor drops off so precipitously in California, it's harder to tether um, once you go past the continental shelf in California than it is inland. Um, and so you have these jur jurisdiction issues of state versus federal waters and marine protected areas. So I know wave energy in California is slightly harder to put in place than it is in other coastal states. Um, but again, that's for my DOE hat, not my Cal EPA hat. And in terms of RPS eligibility, I would just need to get back to you um, on whether it falls into the RPS strategy. Excellent. A few other questions if you have time for them. Um, during the recession, how did you quantify where the reductions came from? So um, even though, even without um, the cap in place, there are still mandatory reporting measures. So uh, people who are covered by the cap and trade program actually have to report their emissions. Additionally, you know, you can, we had to discover a baseline in setting the program. And so we did a lot of this monitoring um, to understand where emissions were coming from over time. So we have, we have actual emissions from the sectors that are represented in that slide. Um, and that's how we understood how our emissions profile changed. But these, you can look on the ARB website, it's arb.ca.gov for our mandatory uh, reporting uh, types of, uh, our mandatory reporting framework, and um, then our monitoring, reporting, and verification framework. So we have independent third-party verifiers who actually will verify these reductions. Great, I already have two other questions listed, and um, JR is actually running a little late, so this is perfect <laughs> if you don't mind sticking around. Nope. Um, one of the questions, and this is coming from our Sacramento team, what are the major mechanisms to coordinate state, regional, and local climate action? Um, I guess I need clar clarity on the question. By mechanisms, do you mean policy mechanisms or um, you know, people to people type things? But just a little more clarity would be great. I will ask for clarity. It might take a few seconds for that to come in. So in the meantime, could you discuss more about the uncertainty over whether we will continue reducing emissions post-2020? Sure. So I would say there's no uncertainty there. We will definitely continue with um, emissions reductions. These, these programs were put in place for the long term. I think what it, the uncertainty is really over that word continue. Um, it, that's written into AB 32. So the word continue is in the statute. And again, the question is really just, do we continue the cap to extend the cap out or do we continue so that the cap decreases over time? And that's the only area of uncertainty. And, and it's a pretty minimal area of uncertainty. I would say that there are, um, the AB 32 detractors would say that it's a large area of uncertainty um, where the, you know, the intent of the word continue can be questioned. Um, whereas the, you know, people within government and other AB32 supporters would say the intent is clear and what the legislative intent was, was in 2006. Um, so I don't want to say too much on that just in, in recognition of the fact that we are being litigated about this fee versus tax program or we're in appeals on that. So um, I will just say that it's really uh, the question over that word continue if we need to, um, you know, pass AB 32 version 2 or, or if we, you know, we're still protected by AB 32 and I would say, you know, that the statute um, should be read and that word continue is in there. Excellent. Sorry for and just circumspect. <laughs> totally understand that, totally understand that. And some clarifications regarding the major mechanisms to coordinate state, regional, and local climate action. Really, they were thinking any of the ones that you mentioned, policies, collaborations, and whatnot, and really how is coordination happening, if it's happening at all? Okay, I see. So, um, the, so as Louise mentioned, we do have an adaptation planning guide that is sort of uh, downscaling, so helping regional governments trying to uh, work on their adaptation plans. In terms of the other local, regional, state level coordination for say these um, scoping plan goals, we, um, we do have 
we do public meetings for pretty much everything we're considering in the climate change mitigation side of things. And we get out to the Valley, to Southern California, um, in the LA area and other areas. We go up to Northern California, we go to the Tahoe area. We, we get out as much as possible to the state to talk about our ideas and our plans and pr solicit feedback to make sure that we're actually addressing those. Um, and I would say that, you know, from my perspective, Coming from the federal government, where I, you know, I, I saw one form of outreach on a project level basis to the state government, um, I think that you know we get out a fair amount. But in terms of ensuring that state policies can be um, sort of scaled to the regional and local level, we could use more feedback about how to do that. And in part, I think the you know the governor has, has shown interest in making sure that local and regional governments have control over their outcomes, um, but that the state provides a general framework or general guidance on, on what the state should look like or the vision for California over time. And of course, that vision can be realized in different ways depending on which eco-region you're in and what your population makeup is and, and what the types of jobs and, and transportation options are there are in your area. So um, I'm sure we can always do more in terms of that coordination effort, but it is this careful dance of, of the state providing guidance but not too much of a heavy hand given that you know, local and regional areas are different and no one size fits all. Excellent, excellent. Um, and I think that we have time for one more question, if you don't mind just sticking around a little bit longer. Go for it. And this is from our North Coast team. They're asking, what is the projection on value, maybe an increase of cap and trade credits over time? An increase of the value, oh, I'm, I'm guessing it means what is the projection for the cost of buying an allowance? That's and what I'm guessing as well. <laughs> okay, so the floor the, the floor price for um, one allowance was ten dollars when the program started. It increases by inflation um, each year and a, a set amount, and so it's up in the I think it's eleven seventy one now. It's it's in the eleven to almost twelve dollar range now. So it will go up um, every year. Uh, so it's it's. You'll, I, you'll see the value change each year, and they post that on the ARB website. Um, the actual cost of an allowance is market driven. So, regardless of what, so if there, you know, there's a floor price, and the allowances have to be traded at a minimum at that floor price, but they can be traded at a higher level based on demand and you know how scarce the resource is. So it could be twenty dollars, it could be twelve dollars, it could be you know it varies. We haven't seen it go dramatically above the price floor. Um, it has stayed you know within a dollar or two of the price floor so far. I hope that answered the question. But if not, feel free to pop me an email. Excellent, and thank you so much. It does look like we are getting a few more emails, or excuse me, a few more questions popping up, so hopefully if everyone can, um, if a question wasn't answered or if anyone needs a little bit more clarification, hopefully they'll be able to reach out to you um, via email. Yes, and ba bear with me if I don't get to you immediately, but um, give me a little time and I will get to you. <laughs> Perfect. Well, again, thank you so much, Ashley, for taking time to to speak with us today. Um, I am going to, again, pause for just one second to get the correct slides up. And I believe that JR is on the line at this point of time, but may be having some problems actually being able to speak to us. So I'm also going to try to resolve that problem. So it might just be a few minutes before we start up again. Thank you. Okay, well, while we're waiting for JR to get on here, I'm just going to address a few things um, that have to do with all of our members, which is mainly about our emails. I know that a lot of you guys were having problems logging on to the emails earlier today. I was able to um, touch base, and it looks like things um, were wrong on a tech end. So at this point of time, they should be corrected. I don't know how many of you have actually taken the chance to um, try to log in just in the next or the last, I don't know, 
30 minutes, an hour or so, and hopefully none of you have been because this conversation thus far has been so engaging, and I'm so glad that we were able to have the speakers that we've had here um, today. But if you do want to try to log in later today, it should be up and running at this point of time. Um, again, remember with your email addresses, you do, when you go to Gmail, you do have to log in with your full email address, which is going to be your first initial, last name, at civicspark.lgc.org. And then the password, of course, is, um, the, is civicspark2 with a capital C and a capital S. So please, if you try logging in today and you have any problems, um, reach out to me and we'll see what we can do about taking care of that. Um, and I guess that if, if we do have any other questions that are sort of more AmeriCorps, pro, or AmeriCorps questions or tomorrow questions, anything about orientation, we also can take a little bit of time right now as we're waiting for our last speaker to join us. If anyone has any questions, I can answer. Okay, so again, going with the wonderful technical um, issues that we've been having recently, we are going to have JR um, join us now. He's going to join us via speakerphone <laughs> held up by Natalie in the office. So hopefully we'll be able to hear him clearly. Um, definitely we'll, we'll try to work with you if you guys aren't able to hear him. Just a little um, quick bio from him. JR De La Rosa is the Assistant Secretary for Climate Change at the California Natural Resources Agency. De La Rosa has served as advisor on renewable energy in the governor's office since 2011. He was an executive fellow in the California's governor office from 2010 to 2011 in a field representative for California State Assembly member Anna Cal Calviero <laughs> from 2008 to 2010. De La Rosa was an intern at the office of Assembly member Joe Calto from 2006 to 2007. Cool. Can, can everyone hear me? We're going to see. All right. Oh, yeah, we can. We can. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jenny. Uh, sorry about the, uh, hold on, I'm going to turn down my other line because it's kind of an echo. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, first off, thank you all uh, for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, this is a, a great effort that we are all partaking in. Uh, addressing climate change is, is very important. It's a very um, stimulating and or difficult issue to address because it touches upon so many different uh, aspects of society and, and various sectors that we all uh, work in. So uh, I'm going to speak on kind of the adaptation side of things and what we're doing um, here in California. So uh, I guess I'll just start off with, you know, we're, we're already seeing the impacts from a changing climate uh, here in California and throughout much of the world. We're dealing with the new normal of a seemingly endless fire season. Uh, we're seeing rising oceans that are threatening our, our well and our coastal cities uh, and vital infrastructure. And uh, we're seeing an earlier melting of snowpack, which uh, will affect our water supply. Uh, these, these are all very big issues and um, require a concerted effort to, uh, to address and to uh, mitigate and adapt to. to. To respond to this unprecedented challenge of, uh, of climate change, uh, California is, is working to reduce emissions. Um, as highlighted by some of uh, my colleagues who worked previously. Uh, so you have the AB32 uh, scoping plan um, in terms of reducing emissions, what we call mitigation. And then you have preparing for impacts, which uh, the Safe Park in California might highlight. Um, and you also have uh, conducting research to inform policy, um, which is the, the research plan and the fourth climate change assessment. Those are, those are some of the categories and things that we're all working on together uh, to address climate change. Um, as you said, as you can tell, it re responding to climate change uh, requires uh, multi-agency collaboration, um, you know, which is highlighted in the work done by uh, some of the interagency working groups, that, such as the Climate Action Team, uh, you have the Drought Task Force, 
and you have uh, the Renewable Energy Policy Group, which is some of the, the groups that um, compile and, and have agencies working with them to address some of these uh, issues of climate change. Um, in California, you know, we, we've shown and we've seen that, that climate action is not mutually exclusive from economic growth, uh, as, as you know, some opponents have claimed. Um, and that's a resource that is uh, well, I guess I, I can back up. So, natural land, uh, forests, woodlands, shrubland, desert, etc., cover over 80% of, of our state. Uh, and with this very large scale, these lands are critical to uh, climate adaptation and mitigation. Uh, the departments, boards, uh, and conservancies that are part of the natural resources agencies uh, have substantial responsibilities with respect uh, to the conditions and uh, trajectories of these lands. Um, on the adaptation side of things, uh, you know, this summer, uh, CNRA, uh, in conjunction with uh, a multitude of uh, agencies, uh, completed the updated plan for the adaptation side of, of the climate equation, uh, the, the safeguarding uh, California plan. Uh, the Safeguard in California plan um, highlights uh, climate risk, uh, discusses progress to date, um, and uh, makes realistic recommendations for nine specific sectors so agriculture, biodiversity, and habitat, emergency management, um, uh, energy, forestry, ocean and coastal ecosystem resources, public health. Uh, transportation and water. Uh, you know, the conditions we we face so far in, in in this year in the state uh, with record droughts, high number of wildfires, um, some of which have been very large and damaging. Uh, you know, are are highlighting that, that the risk that we that we face and that we need to prepare for. Um, Given the potential impacts and the long-term nature of effective planning, uh, it's prudent to begin preparing for these impacts. Uh, actions needed to meet uh, you know, some of these challenges will not be cheap, um, but will cost far less than taking no action. You know, every, every step we take today helps save valuable uh, resources in the future. Um, I guess I can talk about, uh, I'd like to talk about um, the safeguarding plan. Uh, when, when talking about the safeguarding plan there, you know, some of the key takeaways uh, are, you know, we got to figure out a way to uh, mainstream adaptation uh, resiliency into uh, some of our state agency planning, uh, funding, you know, uh, allocation of grants, and some of our infrastructure development. There are uh, different strategies for, for, you know, for this. Uh, it, there's no one size fits all for, for various agencies. Um, and so you have agency implementation, and I think you have uh, kind of communication and getting the word out there and working with uh, the public uh, and you know local government and various stakeholders. So. I, I guess I'd like to start with talking about the, the first big event, uh, which highlighted and, and discussed safeguarding California plan. So that was uh, the it was at the California Adaptation Forum, which was in August, which brought together key agencies, stakeholders, local government um, to address adaptation in California. Uh, there were there were over 800 people in attendance. Uh, you know, there were key participants and promotional sponsors, including. Um, you know, obviously local government commission organized it, but you also had uh, CNRA, uh, Cal Fire, DWR, uh, our Fish and Wildlife uh, folks, Ocean Protection Council, uh, State Parks, Department of Conservation. Uh, these, are, uh, these are on the resources side of things. Um, and some of the key actions that these, these agencies have been taking are um, recently the Ocean Protection Council passed a resolution adopting the principles in the safeguarding plan. Um, and as, uh, and I'll, as I mentioned, CAL FIRE is doing a lot of work on forest management and research, which I'll touch upon. 
kind of the, the medication, the adaptation stuff. Um, TDFW, uh, you know, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, is working to incorporate the safeguarding principles into their uh, state wildlife action plan, uh, which is scheduled for completion in 2015. Um, you have the, the kind of research side of things, which will, uh, it, it's a little longer to memorize if you move in two or three years uh, in advance, but you have the four climate change assessment, um, which is focusing on the research needs pertaining to, or highlighting uh, resiliency and adaptation. Um, so you have these key elements, uh, you also have mitigation. Um, and so, so what some of the agencies are doing, uh, you have you have Cal Fire uh, for, for, in terms of our forest issues, uh, which is working on a on a forest carbon plan, um, which will be developed by a recently established uh, team of the work on the forest uh, carbon action team, um, it, it, which is being spearheaded by Cal Fire. With EPA participation, CNRA, uh, as, as well as other folks, um, you know the, the goal of the forest uh, carbon plan is to provide near-term, mid-term, and long-term strategies, uh, uh, goals and objectives to ensure that forests in California are uh, what we call a net carbon sink um, that are resilient to potential disturbances, including climate change. Potential elements of scope benefits that, that tie into uh, the mitigation factor, which means reducing CHG emissions. Um, you have, uh, let's see, still talking about Cal Fires. Cal Fires is about 42 million per uh, greenhouse gas sequestering activities uh, in the areas of uh, urban and, and community forestry. Uh, forestry pest control, reforestation. Um, chills management, uh, et cetera. And the bulk of these funds, about uh, 80 million, I believe, uh, will be to support urban and community forestry projects with a focus on disadvantaged communities um, established in uh, SP 535, which is the Tilly Hill Bill. CFW uh, received 25 million for wetland restoration uh, and just recently actually held a peace grant solicitation. Um, and so uh, what we see um, is with wetlands, you have you know the GHG reduction potential, um, but you also have adaptation potential with uh, you know uh, helping uh, us cope with sea level rise as well as um, storm and flood protection. Uh, and so you know mitigation efforts will, will reduce, will help reduce the magnitude and impact of climate change, um, but a lot of prevent from occurring, and, and you know we have adaptation, which is equally important. Um, so that those are some of the, the key things we're working on. Um, and then I'm doing on time, but it might make sense to open up to uh, folks for questions. If there's any questions. Definitely, and our questions have been coming in a little bit late, so it might just take a few minutes for. Oh, no. <laughs> Four things to come up. Um, let's see what we have now, if anything. I don't think anyone has submitted a question as of now, but let's give it a few seconds and see what comes in. Okay. We're getting close to five, so. <laughs> also appreciate that. <laughs> And JR, I believe that we have your um, contact information. Would it be okay if anyone has a question sort of after the fact? I know that there are actually in a lot of, um, you know, local government offices, and so they're probably also being shooed out as it's getting close to five. Um, would they be able to touch base with you over email after the fact, anything along those lines? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Via email, um, you can include my number, too. Um, uh, totally available. Wonderful. Uh, so, yeah. Well, it's, 
if no questions are popping up now and it doesn't look like anything is on my radar, um, if any questions come up after the fact, we'll, I will send them your information and send them your way. And in the meantime, thank you again so much for being available today, especially with any and all technical issues that we're having with this lovely webinar. <laughs> no, no worries. Thank you all. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you. Bye. Okay, wonderful. Thank you guys um, for for dealing with us. I know that many of you are being shooed out of your office right now, um, so I will just say I hope that today was another fabulous day. We will be with you um, tomorrow again, tomorrow morning, and in the meantime, have a wonderful evening, and thank you for your participation. Bye, everyone. <laughs>